uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, admin for the start. So my name's Richie, I'm the Lost Peatlands project manager, and I'll be covering a bit of webinar admin just to start. So standard stuff, we'll keep all um, mics on mute and all cameras off, please, to help the bandwidth. Uh, Charles is going to give a presentation today. We're on site tomorrow. And um, in terms of questions, what we're going to do is keep all questions for tomorrow on site. So if you do think of anything during this presentation or after, please do jot it down. Uh, we'll cover it tomorrow. You may have noticed I'm started recording. Uh, there's some participants that won't be able to make today's uh, webinar, so I'm going to distribute this recording afterwards. Um, with all cameras off, if you don't want your face shown, that should be sorted. But if there's need for a further editing, I shall cover that. Um, so with everybody in, and just I'm going to admit a couple more, and we shall be ready to go. Yeah, that's all. So Charles, over to you. OK, thanks, Rich. Um, right, macroscopic fungi. This is uh, very much an introduction to the biology and ecology and identification of macroscopic fungi. And of course, it runs in line with the, the field meeting that we'll be doing tomorrow, where hopefully we'll be able to see, you know, lots of these things live in the flesh, so to speak. And I'm assuming that everybody is more or less at a beginner level here. So please uh, excuse me if you are beyond that. Um, but I am assuming from the start that most people are at the, the beginner level. OK, so let's delve into it. Uh, first of all, let's ask this very simple question. What are fungi? Um, let's get some obvious things out of the way first. First of all, they're not plants. That's really important. Secondly, they're not animals either, uh, but they are more like animals than plants. Um, in fact, they have their own kingdom. And, um, you know, that's really important too. Most of them are microscopic, but some of them produce macroscopic fruiting bodies, which is why we are here today to, to talk about them and specifically to talk about how to go about identifying them. Um, fungi are interesting in that they have cell walls which contain chitin, but not cellulose. If we were talking about plants, we'd be talking about cell walls composed of cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose. But no, they, they contain chitin, which is, of course, the, the substance that makes up the exoskeleton of arthropods. So that's really quite interesting. And it's one of these areas where fungi share quite a lot with animals. And they are eukaryotes. They're not like bacteria. They're not prokaryotes. They're eukaryotes, just like we are eukaryotes. And all animals and all plants are eukaryotes. So that's really important, too. And they are heterotrophic. So we call them heterotrophs. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. They're everywhere, which of course is really important. And there's lots of them, possibly as many as 1.5 million on, on the planet. The study of fungi is called mycology, and the people who study fungi are called mycologists. They have enormous value in biodiversity and in biotechnology. That, that cannot be overstated. OK, so what do we mean then by a macroscopic by macroscopic fungi, because you know that's the, the subject of this course. Most fungi, as I've just said, are microscopic, although it is sometimes possible to see them as moles or wefts of mycelium. Uh, but this is not what we mean by macroscopic fungi. I'll, I'll show you a, a picture later on which explains that. What we mean by macroscopic fungi here is a fruiting body that can be seen with the naked eye and which can be quite large. And by a fruiting body, we mean a solid macroscopic structure made up of mycelium, whose main purpose is to produce and disseminate spores. In this course, we'll be talking about macroscopic fruiting bodies produced by two groups of fungi, a group called the ascomycetes and a group called the basidiomycetes. We'll be concentrating more on the basidiomycetes than the ascomycetes. OK. So as I've said, the study of fungi is called mycology and the people who study fungi are called mycologists. Let's get another few things out of the way. Lots of mycologists um, began as botanists and traditionally mycology has only ever been taught in botany departments in the past. But as I've said, fungi are not plants, but many books on plants contain chapters about fungi. So that's a, li a little bit confusing, really. But I think it's really important that from the outset, we all sort of realise that fungi are not plants. Some mycologists study and record slime moulds 
as part of their mycological sort of, uh, you know, studies. But slime molds are not fungi. I should emphasize that as well. Slime molds are a pretty heterogeneous group of organisms, some of which are more closely related to protozoa, which of course are animals. And most mycologists ignore lichens, even though lichens are mostly composed of fungi. So we'd be quite accurate in describing lichens as fungi, but most mycologists totally ignore them. So here's a couple of photos. There's four panels showing uh, four types of slime molds, which are often studied by mycologists. But as I said, they are not fungi and they're not going to be part of this course either. Although we may come across them and if we can identify them, we will. Um, but this is a really specialised area of uh, mycology. Um, these are some lichens. Lichens are rarely studied by mycologists, but really they are fungi. So, um, but again, it's not part of this course, so we won't be uh, really talking much about them at all. So what are fungi then? How are they uh, sort of taxonomically divided up? There's all sorts of confusion about the taxonomy of fungi and there's all sorts of schemes out there. This is one of the more modern schemes showing you the different types of fungi. So running through the list there, we've got Microsporidia, Chytridomycota, Blastocladiomycota, Neocalimastigomycota, Glomeromycota, Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Now the Ascomycota are what I'm going to be referring to as the Ascomycetes and the Basidiomycota are going to be what I'm going to refer to as the Basidiomyces. So they are the two important elements of the course. The others above there, the other five groups of fungi are really very important, incredibly interesting. For instance, the Glomeromycota are a group which contains the Arbuscular Mycorrhiza, and 95% or more of all plants on Earth are infected by Arbuscular Mycorrhiza. It's a symbiotic association and it's incredibly important in the sort of uh, nutrition physiology of plants. But it's Ascomycota or Ascomycetes and Basidiomycota or Basidiomycetes that we're interested in. So I mentioned that fungi are heterotrophic. So let's sort of describe the heterotrophic lifestyles of, of these fungi. Um, from the, again, from the very beginning, we should realize that fungi cannot photosynthesize. They're totally unlike plants from that point of view that they are heterotrophs. OK, the heterotrophic lifestyle, well, some uh, fungi are saprophytes, so they live off dead organic matter, and they are really important decomposers and recyclers. And others are parasites, so they live off other living organisms. They cause diseases of plants and diseases of animals. There are quite a lot of important diseases of humans, for instance, which are caused by fungi, uh, particularly in people who are, who are very compromised immune systems. And then there's symbiosis where we have fungi sharing resources with another living organism. It could be a tree or it could be a bryophyte or it could be an alga. Okay. In the lichen symbiosis, you have a fungus sharing resources with a cyanobacterium or with an alga. And we know now that, that, that many wax caps have very interesting uh, biotrophic associations with bryophytes. Uh, where there's, in the past, lots of people thought that wax caps were simple saprophytes. We now know that the, it's more complicated than that. So the symbiosis thing is really important. And as far as we're concerned, one of the most important symbiotic conditions is that which involves mycorrhiza. Uh, in this case, we're talking about ectomycorrhiza, mostly anyway, where fungi, the fungi we are interested in in this course, um, form an association with certain trees. I'll say more about it later. So in their heterotrophic lifestyles, fungi play a crucial role in the health and stability of ecosystems. Um, habitat ecology very much depends on this sort of uh, symbiotic association. And also fungi play a crucial role in the global carbon cycle and in the global nitrogen cycle. So you can't really overemphasize how important fungi are. They are really very, very important at all sorts of levels. So here's a typical heterotrophic lifestyle. These are some moles growing on fruit. The one growing on a, an orange there, some growing on bread. I'm sure we've all um, found something like this in one of our bread bins or cupboards or, or whatever in the past. So it's a very, very good example of the saprophytic lifestyle of, of a fungus. 
But these fruiting bodies here, which are fruiting bodies of, of a group of um, basidiomyces called bonnets, these are also saprophytic, and they're saprophytic on the litter in the forest. And um, with a bit of luck, we'll see both of these species uh, tomorrow when we, when we go out into the field. So bonnets are typical litter saprophytes. So they live off the dead litter, remains of leaves, remains of branches, the trees, bits of wood, and so on and so forth. And here we've got, you know, two really common wood degrading uh, saprophytes. The one at the top, the yellow one, is a yellowing curtain crust, Stelium subtormentosum, and the one at the bottom is probably one of the most common uh, fungi in Britain, the turkey tail, Trometes versicula. And what is going on here is it absolutely incredible. Wood is made up more or less of cellulose and uh, lignin. Okay, now lignin is a pretty difficult thing to break down, and so is cellulose. So there are only certain living organisms that can actually do this, can actually break wood down. Um, but, but the payoff is enormous because cellulose is made up of glucose. So once you've broken down the cellulose to glucose, you've got a free lunch, and that's absolutely fantastic. The only thing you've got to cope with then is all the other lingerers in the environment that also want a bit, bit of that action. And as a result of that, fungi exude all sorts of toxins which prevent other um, organisms from, from getting at the resource that, they, that they've just made available to themselves. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating, the sort of wood degrading um, biochemistry and ecology. This beautiful little thing is called oak pin, uh, Cudoniella acicularis, and it grows on sort of fallen oak branches. It's also a wood saprophyte. And there, that's chicken of the woods. I'm sure most of you have seen this in the past, Lidoporus sulfurius. It's both saprophytic and parasitic. It grows almost exclusively on oak. And um, most oaks that have become hollow have usually become hollow, hollow as a result of a uh, parasitic uh, sort of association with, with chicken of the woods. So it's a very, very common uh, hollowing sort of uh, fungus. This is also a very famous sort of a parasitic fungus, Armillaria melia, very, very destructive, um, causes destruction to all sorts of street, trees and uh, shrubs in gardens, in parks and in forests. And after it's, it's sort of killed its host, it also lives off it saprophytically afterwards. And then you've got these really fabulous little things forms of saprophytism. Here we've got the arrow is pointing to a really little toadstool there. I'm sure you can see it. And it's growing on the rotting gills there, or blackling brittle gill, Russula nigricans. So the big fruiting bodies in the picture are the Russula. Uh, and the little fruiting bodies which are growing on them, that's Astrophora parasitica, which grows on the sort of dying moribund uh, fruiting bodies of, of blackling brittle, brittle gill. So that's an interesting form of saprophytism too. And then very specialised saprophytisms like this is conifer corn, uh, Biospora myosura, which grows on pine cones. Here it's grown on a lodgepole pine cone. And here's another parasite. Uh, this is called Pseudobolitis parasiticus, the parasitic bolete. And the arrow there is pointed to a, a group of two uh, parasitic bolets, which are growing on the common earth wall, which is the big thing in the picture there. And you can also see there's two on the left and two on the right growing on this fruiting body of Scleroderma citrinum, the common earth. And um, the amazingly interesting hazel gloves, Hippo, Creopsis, Rhododendri, uh, actually parasitizes glue crust fungus, Aminochete corrugata, um, on things like hazel, um, but more often in our area on blackthorn, in, in my experience anyway. Um, so that's really interesting as well. And this is totally fascinating. This is Onogena equina, which is called the horn stalk ball. And you can see that it, this is this is a, a, a skull of a ram. And it also grows on um, uh, hooves of, of, of horses, uh, which is why it's called equina, Onogena, Onogena equina. Now, what you should note here is that the, the horn stalk ball is growing on the horns, but it's not actually growing on the skull itself. And there's a very good reason for that. The horns are made out of keratin. Keratin is a protein. And when you, you break down keratin, which is not easy to do, what you get 
is amino acids, which are carbon and nitrogen rich. So you get a very, very good source of food. Bone, on the other hand, which makes up the skull, is basically calcium phosphate, which is an inorganic compound. So it's not really very nutritious. You can't really get much out of bone, but you can get an awful lot out of keratin. OK, so things like rhinoceros horns and the hooves of horses, they're really interesting structures because they're made up of keratin strands woven around each other. Uh, and that is what you see here. The horn stalk ball is specifically growing on the keratin structure and not on the bone structure. OK, so fungi are, can, can, can live in two sorts of ways. They can either live as yeasts, which you see there on the left, or they can live as mycelium, which you can see there on the right. Now, yeasts are fundamentally single cell structures which can bud and divide. You can see budding and dividing in that photograph there. Whereas mycelium is made up of strands, uh, which in turn are made up of hyphae. So if we look closely, if that, let's say that mycelium where there was a mycelium of a basidium mycete, it might look like this and the, under the scanning electron microscope. And the individual cells in the mycelium are called hypha, plural hyphae. What you can also see there are little bumps on the hyphae, and they are called clamps or clamp connections. And I'm not going to go into any detail here because this is fundamentally microscopic structure, and we're not talking about microscopic examination of fungi in this course. But I'm telling you this because it is quite important, because you only find clamps or clamp connections in basidiomycetes. So when you look at mycelium under the microscope and you see clamp connections, you know you're looking at a basidiomycete. OK, so we're interested in macroscopic fungi. First of all, this is what moles look like growing on a, an agar plate. OK, and in a sense, they're macroscopic, but that's not what we mean by a macroscopic fruiting body. You know, these are just moles growing as a colony on an agar plate. And you see similar things of moles growing on wallpaper, moles growing on a wet surface of a wall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're macroscopic in the sense that you can see them but they're not macroscopic fruity bodies in the sense that we mean macroscopic fruity bodies. This is what we mean by macroscopic fruity bodies, things that look like this, right? And I'm sure you've all got what I'm talking about here. So this is, you know, the core of this course. So in this course, the macroscopic fruity bodies we're, we're interested in, not bodos as I've got there, that's a type in there, sorry about that. Macroscopic fruity bodies are formed by ascomycetes and by basidiomycetes. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the ascomycetes, but I am going to sort of uh, take you through it um, fairly quickly. Ascomycetes really are defined by the fact that they produce their spores, which are called ascospores, inside a cell structure called the ascus. OK, and there you can see an ascus with eight, well, uh, sorry, a diagram showing what an ascus with eight ascospores might actually look like. So it's a sac-like structure called the ascus, which contains these spores called ascospores. Now, there may not be eight, there may be four. Um, so, you know, that, that's not written in Talos of Storm, but they're usually multiples of four that, that, you, that you find inside the ascus. And this is what actual um, assay, assay is the plural of ascus. This is what actual assay look like. These are diagrams uh, I've taken from Wikipedia, so you know I'm giving them the sort of due uh, uh, acclaim for that. Um, on the left-hand side, that's an ascus from Morcella, and on the right-hand side, which is a moral, and on the right-hand uh, yeah, on the right-hand side, an ascus from Sordaria, and you can see in both the eight ascus spores, which are contained inside the ascus. That's important inside the ascus. So identification of the larger microscopic ascos. I would suggest at this stage, at the beginner level, um, that one should do this just by familiarizing yourself with the common ones that are illustrated in the guidebooks. They are mostly very, very distinctive. And of course, they don't have gills or pores as you would find in a typical basidiomycete. The best way to confirm that a specimen is an ascomycete, of course, is to take a small sample from the surface of the fruit and body and squash it and look for, under the microscope, look for ascus with ascus spores. 
but you can't do that in the field and you may not have a microscope anyway. And, and in actual fact, we are assuming that most of you don't have um, access to microscopes uh, to do this. And you may have that and you may want to do this. And if you do, that's great. Uh, and from there, you could take things on much, much further than I'm going to uh, take you in this course. So I'll take you and show you some common macroscopic ascomites, which, which are fairly easy to identify once you become familiar with them. Cup fungi are a, a pretty um, common group of ascomyces. They're, they're a type of ascomycete called discomycetes, and they're often called discos uh, for short. So uh, you may have seen all of these in the past, or perhaps you've, you've not seen any of them, but one of the most striking uh, cup fungi is the scarlet elf cup there on the left, Sarcoscypha ostriaca. But a very, very common elf cup at this time of year uh, is uh, the bay cup, Pisiza bardia, and a less common one, but one which is out there, is one of the otidias called Tania otidia alutasia. But, you know, they, they've got a look about them, and you would sort of know straight away, particularly if you became familiar, familiar with them from pictures in books, that they were ascomyces as soon as you saw them. There are then a whole group of much, much smaller discourse which are another kettle of fish. Uh, and in some ways, they belong to a, a totally different speciality. And there are many mycologists who specialize simply only in these small discos. Some of them are really beautiful, but they are, you know, really small. Uh, so there's lots of these small discos like this, Sciathicula coronata, uh, and many, many more. They're rarely included in guidebooks. And that's because they really are a specialist area. And so if you do get into this, and you know, I, I would really like it if many of you did, then you need to buy specialized books and probably go on special courses in order to learn all about them. So let me just show you some more uh, common ascomycetes. On the left there, you've got Daldinia concentrica crampols or King Alfred's cakes, uh, which normally just grows on ash. There are other species of Daldinia which grow on other hosts as well. Um, and then there's Leotia lubrica, which is a pretty common ascomycete that occurs in uh, spruce forests and other conifer forests as well. That's called jelly babies for obvious reasons. Really nice. Fungi have got some really excellent English names. And then these are morals, Morchella esculenta there, which is very common on sand dunes, and Morchella elata, which is probably an introduction, uh, an alien neophyte uh, in our flora now. Uh, which grows often on um, wood chip and uh, stuff like that. And then we've got the wonderful saddles. They're all called Helvella. So they're the up top left, very, very common um, saddle, Helvella crisper. Uh, to the right, Helvella atra, not quite so common. Uh, Helvella lacun lacunoso on the bottom left is fairly common, but not as common as Helvella crisper. Uh, in the middle bottom there, Helvella macropus, uh, which has got a very, very sort of agaric-like stipe in actual fact. So, you know, the fact that it's not an agaric, you can tell straight away because it doesn't have gills and it doesn't have pores either. But there's a sort of convergent evolution thing going on here, isn't there? But that's a saddle. And then lastly, Helvella elastica there on the right-hand side, um, which uh, is not a common saddle, but, you know, it, it does turn up in conifer forest particularly fairly frequently. This is a really common ascomycete, which is the candle snuff fungus. And I'll bring some of this to the course tomorrow. Um, and I'm sure most of you have probably seen this anyway. What is really interesting about Xyleria epoxylon candle snuff fungus is those white tips there are actually a mass of spores, And spores are asexual spores, they're not sexual spores, and ascospores are sexual spores, but canidia spores are asexual spores. Many ascomycetes have two phases in their life cycle, or one or other of two phases in their life, school, life cycle. One is called the anamorphic phase, which is asexual, and the other is called the teleomorphic phase, which is sexual. So there you're looking at the white canidia spores is an anamorphic phase uh, of the uh, life cycle. Xyleria hypoxylon. Okay, so 
the, the picture I want you to get is that the majority of large art schools don't look like the city of Mises, and they're rel relatively easy to recognize and learn. And for beginners, I would say that's that's really what you want to do uh, is find a section in your guidebook which covers art school Mises, look at the pictures. There won't be an awful lot of them, but you'll get to know them very, very quickly that way. Uh, and some of them, you know, are really distinctive, like the orange peel fungus and bog beacon mitrilla paradosa, which generally is is seen uh, only in spring uh, and it grows in very wet sort of boggy places with sphagnum and things like that. OK. So let's go to the Bisidiomyces now then. Um, and again, they can be divided up in any number of ways. And I, I, I sort of rack my brain trying to find an easy way to do this. Um, so I come up with this scheme. It's not ideal, but it, it's sort of a good way to look at basidiomycetes. Basidiomycetes are um, pretty variable and diverse in their structures. Um, so we've got things like puffballs, earth stars, stinkhorns, uh, and cage fungi. We, we, in the past, we would have referred to these as gasteromycetes. I'll come to that in a minute. And then we've got chanterelles and other things that look like chanterelles, which are called cantharelloids. And then we've got coral fungi, giant clubs and species like gonfus, uh, sorry, generally like gonfus. And then tooth fungi and earth fans and polypores. And then a, another specialised group called corticoids or resupinates. And then we've got jelly fungi and the dacromycetes. And then we've got bolites. And finally, we've got agarix. And of this list, I'll show you some of the things in all of those categories there. But of this list is the bullets and the garricks that are really the most important components of this course. So there's a, a diagram from Jeffrey Kibbe's book. I, I hope Jeffrey doesn't mind. I'm giving him um, the acclaim there at the bottom. Um, the mid, on the left hand side there, sorry, my cursor isn't working. I'd love to be able to point to these things to you, but it's not working. Um, at the top, on the left hand side at the top there, you can see the ascus spores produced inside the ascus which I've been talking about um, just before this. And then below that in the middle, you can see that what you're looking at there is a section from the gills, the outer part of the gills of a typical agaric, a typical toadstool, if you like. And the cells there, or some of the cells there, are called basidia, singular basidium. And on each basidium, spores are produced, and these spores are called basidiospores. But the important thing here is that basidia spores are formed outside on the basidium, unlike ascus spores, which are formed inside an ascus. So that's a really important difference between ascus spores and uh, ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. Um, and in the diagram in middle left, that shows the sort of typical sort of uh, basidium, basidia spore structure of most uh, basidiomycetes which have an agaric like structure in other words a stipe and a cap on the bottom you've got three other types of basidia and basidia spore formations one which is typical of uh, auricularia one which is typical of tremella one which is typical of the exidia and a law the, the the actual specific form of the basidium is different to the specific form of the basidium in an agaric you know, the overall concept is the same. You've got basidia spores being produced outside of the basidium. And then those basidia spores are ballistically shot off uh, that little stalk, which is called the sterigmata, um, and then disseminated into the air. On the right hand side, that's a, a very poor photograph of mine showing the actual basidia of Entoloma cetrata, which we may actually see tomorrow. Um, Entoloma citratum is an example of a, an agaric which produces basidia, which produce two basidia spores and not four basidia spores per basidium. So you may have uh, two basidia spores or four basidia spores on the basidium. In fact, sometimes you may only have one. Um, so it, that does vary a bit. But I would say, I guess, most basidium mycetes produce four basidia spores on the basidium. So that's the technical sort of uh, definition, really, of basidium mycete. So let's sort of surf our way through the different types of basidium mycete, which produce macroscopic fruit and bodies. We've got what I call the gastromycetes, puffballs, earth stars, stinkhorns, and birds' nest fungi. 
This is a really, really common gastromycete. This is the common puffball, Lycopurdum pelatum. You might see that tomorrow. This is um, the common earth star or collared earth star, Geostrum triplex. I don't think we see it on site tomorrow, but I will bring a specimen with me so you can actually see what it actually looks like. This is a stinkhorn, which I'm sure you're all heard of and been aware of and may possibly have seen as well. So they are all gastromycetes. And then there are other types of visidiomycetes which don't have gills or pores. On the left there, we've got pale stag's horn, which is a fairly recent sort of colonizer of uh, dead or dying uh, conifer wood, you know, conifer plantations, Calocera polidospathulata. And then on the right hand side, we've got yellow stag's horn, Calocera viscosa, which is a very, very common um, basidiomycete in our conifer forest. And hopefully we'll see some of that tomorrow. Um, not so common, indeed really quite rare, is the greening coral fungus from area Aviatina, but it is out there. And all of these photographs are from Neath Talbot or Ronda Canantaf, by the way. So um, you can expect to find any of these in uh, our counties. And then on the right side, we've got wrinkled coral fungus, Clavulina rigosa, and then white coral fungus, Clavulina coralides. They're all very, very distinctive things. Um, you might think that chanterelles actually have gills. And that fruiting body there does look as if it's producing gills underneath the cap. But they are actually foes. Uh, this is a fairly primitive condition, and they're not regarded as gills per se, but foes. So the cantharelloids belong to this specific group of basidiomyces, which are not strictly agarics. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, uh, again, I'm sure a group you are familiar with are the tooth fungi. Underneath the cap, you get these teeth being produced, and on the, the outside of those teeth, on the surface of the teeth, that's where the basidia are produced, um, where the basidia spores are then produced on the basidia. So that's the wood hedgehog, really common fungus in beech woods in our area. Um, this is a photograph which wasn't taken in East Patel, but this, that I photographed this specimen actually in Colorado. Uh, this is Sarcodon imbricatus, and is another example of a tooth fungi. Okay, and then there's this other large group of basidiomycetes, which again are not agarics, they, they don't produce gills, but they have pores. Um, and these are mostly bracket fungi. It's a sort of specialized area, although many of the brackets are fairly easy to, to recognize, and I'll show you some of them. Trometes giposa, there on the left, lumpy bracket. Um, specifically associated with beech, very, very common. Equally common there on the right is Didelioptus confragosa, the blushing bracket, which usually only grows on willow. Here's a, a close up of Didelioptus confragosa, showing you underneath of each of those brackets there, where you can see the, the, the typical pore structures. And there's great variation in the size of pores, and, and in actual fact, in the architecture of the pores as well. So, for instance, with conifer maize gill, Gliophyllum CPRM, which grows on dead conifer logs, here it is growing on Sitka spruce. You can see on the right side there that the, the, the pores actually form a maze like structure rather than distinct round pores. And, and that's a good way of identifying this really very attractive um, uh, fungus. If you see a very, very large fungus like this growing on beech, 10 to 1, it'll be Ganoderma australi, uh, which is, a, a, again, a very, very common um, fungus in that category. And then this also, uh, the birch polypore, is a really common bracket fungus and is specific for birch. Lots of these brackets are specific for particular tree hosts, and that's always a clue and a good clue as to what they are. So once you know what the bracket is growing on, that can take you to, you know, fairly close to identifying perhaps what it is, although it may not be so easy in the end. OK, so we've been looking at brackets, typical brackets here, which are sort of like semicircular structures, flat semicircular structures, which are stuck onto trees or, or, or onto logs or whatever. And they don't have stems or stipes. But beware, there are some polypores which do have stipes. This is polyporus brumalis, which is a spring fruiting 
um, polypore. And you can see it does have a distinct uh, stem or stipe, and the, the pores actually run down the stem. And at beginner level, I suppose it's conceivable you might see that and think, oh, it's a bolete, because it looks like an agaric with pores, but it isn't. It's a polypore. I mean, it's a pretty good example of one of these things you've got to sort of learn, you know, the exceptions to the rule. OK, very quickly, I'll talk about rusupinates. Uh, these are um, like bracket fungi, they usually usually grow in wood and they would degrade in species, uh, but they usually grow in some way flattened against the substrate or curling up away from it. Uh, one of the biggest groups is a, a, a are in a genus called Sterium, so you can see there's a number of Sterium species here. The one on the top left is particularly called that's common as Sterium or Sutum. So, um, you know, the, some of them are really easy to identify. A couple of them can be a little bit tricky. Um, here's another fairly distinctive resupine called Shizopora paradoxa, where the, the pores are actually formed in a sort of maze-like formation, as we saw earlier with maize scale. OK, and this is probably one of the most beautiful of all the resupinates. This is cobalt crust, which is the most beautiful colour blue. Um, it's not terribly uncommon, actually, in South Wales. So uh, it's it's a, probably a fungus which is associated with Atlantic conditions um, in Europe. And it's a really beautiful thing to find. Blue is, is quite an unusual colour in nature. And that, that is real blue pigment, which is causing that coloration, so that, that's really nice. So look out for that, it's a nice thing. So that that's sort of gets out of the way all the sort of things that, um, which are, are not Pisidium isage, which are bolites or agaric. So now let's concentrate on macroscopic fruiting bodies that we often refer to as mushrooms and toadstools. And these are the bolites and the agaric. So we'll start with the bolites. Once upon a time, uh, when I first started getting interested in fungi, um, all the bolites were called boletus something or other. There was just one genus. Now, there are loads of genera of bolites. Uh, some of the common ones are boletus itself, lexinium, suilus, xerocomus, and xerocomelus. And there are others as well, imleria, uh, neobolitus, and many others too. Really very, very important thing to, to remember is that most bullets have mycorrhizal associations with trees, and many of them are specifically associated with particular trees. And if you know that, and if you know the species that your specimen is associated with, that is an enormously good clue, clue to identifying what the specimen is. So I, I cannot overemphasize that enough. So again, we'll surf through a few of these typical bullets. This is probably the most famous of the Boletuses. Uh, this is Boletus edulis. And the Boletuses are characterized by having a network on, the, on their stipes or stems. And you can see in the diagram on the right-hand side, a very distinctive white network there on that uh, decapitated stipe, um, so, which is a typical and characteristic feature of penny bun or sep, Boletus edulis. Um, color change in the stipe and in the cap, in the flesh in general, of bullets is really very important sometimes um, in identifying what it is. So the identification of the menu requires observation of colour changes in the flesh. Uh, and so you may, must make particular note of this with bullets is often. Uh, one of the ones which has the most striking colour changes is Neobolitus luridiformis, uh, which I think is called a scarlet bullet. Um, because its, it's gills can often be a really rich red colour. Uh, not gills, sorry, its pores can be a, a rich red colour. And if you slice the fruit and body enough, it goes blue instantly, a very, very intense blue colour. So that's an important clue. And then there's the, the group of bullets which are called Suilus. Um, many of them grow with conifers. Um, they're the only ones, I think, and maybe, maybe Emma will put me uh, right here, but I think they're the only bullets which have a ring on the stem. I may be wrong about that, but many of them do have a ring on, on their stem. This is large bullet on the left, uh, which um, has been incredibly common in South Wales because of the amount of large we used to have in our landscape. Um, there is still large in our landscape, so there's still large bullet in our landscape, but not as much as there used to be. That is a really easy 
Suilas to identify. But it also comes in a, a, a sort of a richer brown colour as well, uh, which is a, a, a rarer variety, and we have quite a lot of that um, in, in South Wales too. On the right-hand side, you've got the bovine bullet, Suilas bovinus, and one of the uh, really good ID features for that is the size of the pores. You can see the, the one there that's upside down, the pores underneath the, the, the cap are absolutely enormous. Um, so it's a really good clue to it being Suilas bovinus. And then another group of bleats are in the genus called Lexinum. Uh, so we've got uh, the brown birch bleat, probably the most common bleat that we have in South Wales, in my opinion. And then on the right hand side, the orange birch bleat. They're absolutely specific for um, birch. The brown birch bleat um, can be tricky to identify. And in fact, it comes in a number of varieties now, which, which have been raised to specific rank. So some of them are, are now known as different species. And perhaps we'll talk more about that tomorrow if um, we encounter some of them. One of the features of Lexinum is the stippling on the stipe. Um, that can be very, very uh, obvious and it will help you to identify it as a Lexinum. And then there's a group of bleach which are called xerocomoids. Um, their characteristic feature is if you take the fruiting body in your hand and sort of snap it, don't cut it, but snap it. Then if you look at the diagram, sorry, the picture on the left hand side, that little triangular segment there in the middle, um, you might just be able to make out that the, the, the tubes, which you can see there in a longitudinal section, have actually split. Now that doesn't happen with other, other bullets. If you snap another bullet, and another, another type of bleed, which is not a xerocoma bleed, in the same way, the tubes remain intact. This is a very good clue that you're dealing with a xerocoma bleed, that if you snap it open like that, that you get, you fracture uh, the tubes so that you get sections through them, they're broken. Um, after that, <laughs> good luck, because xerocomas and um, which are both xerocoma bleeds, can be quite difficult. But again, colour change in the stipe can be very, very important. And the host, the tree that is, is associated with, can also be very important. Some of them are fairly straightforward. Xerocomelases tend to have caps that crack, uh, like the one there, bottom right. But cracking can happen um, with lots of fungi and, and lots of bullets as well. But it is, I guess, a feature of Xerocomelas much more than it is of other bullets. All right, so last section then is to look at the agarics. These are the fungi with gills, so you can see a collection there of a typical agarics. And, and these are, I guess, more than bolides even, uh, what we regard as sort of toadstools or, or mushrooms. Here's a lovely little diagram uh, from a really old uh, textbook showing, um, this is death cap Amanita phylloides, a drawing of Amanita phylloides. And I've used this just to show you the the sort of names of the different parts of the fruiting body of a typical garlic. You've got the cap at the top, the technical term is pileus, and then the stem, of course, technical term for that is stipe, I've already used that term. Uh, and in this particular, in death cap, you've got a ring on the stem, which is called the annulus, that was once the veil that covered the gills. And you've also got at the bottom of the stipe, a sac-like thing called the vulva. And that was the universal veil that enclosed the whole fruiting body before it emerged from the soil. So just for you to understand some of the terminology here. Now, when you're looking at the cap, um, these are the things you, you need to take note of. First of all, colour, with the proviso that colour can be very variable, even in the same species, and it may actually change with age. Texture is important. Is it dry? Is it slimy? Is it fibrous? Is it lumpy? Is it shiny? Is it dull? Are there striations or are there sort of sulcate edges? I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. Are there veil fragments or scales on the, on the cap? Is there an umbo? I'll show you what that is in a moment too. Is the cap hygrophonous? I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. Does the cuticle peel? And if it does, how much does it peel? Is there a smell? Now, again, note that many people vary greatly in their ability to detect, to detect certain smells. So I mean, some people can't smell even the most pungent fungal smells um, for genetic reasons. And so you, you have to be aware of that. 
So I can't think of a genera which is more complicated in terms of cap colour than the brittle uh, gills. So the, this is the group in the, in the genus Russula. Um, in that photograph there, we are looking at just two species. And, you know, uh, to a novice, it is mind boggling which, which is which. Uh, you know, so we've got Russula pularis and we've got Russula grassolima, both of which are virtual species in that picture there. So that's how complicated cap colour can be. So, you know, you, you've just got to be aware of things like that. This is a species we will see tomorrow, the primrose brittle gill. And it too also comes in some quite confusing colour forms. Sometimes it's a dark, purpley red colour. And sometimes it's a paler, sort of lilac-y, violet -y colour. And sometimes it can be very pale indeed. Sometimes it can actually be yellow. Um, so it can be very confusing. What it always has is it starts off with white gills, but they go yellow. They go a lovely primrose colour yellow, which is why it's called the primrose brittle gill. Again, on the left hand side there, we've got a white toadstool at the top. We've got a sort of lilac toadstool at the bottom. They're both the same species. It's Inus sibigeophila. One at the top is given va variety rank. It's called Inus sibigeophila var geophila. And the one at the bottom is called Inus sibigeophila var lilacina. And then on the right hand side, we've got some more Russula pularis. Now, as Russula pularis ages, it tends to go yellow. Uh, that's often a clue as to what it is. Otherwise, you could confuse it with several other species of Russula. Um, some toadstools have characteristic fibrous caps. Uh, there's a whole group of these which are called fiber caps. They're in the genus Inosipi, as we saw a few minutes ago. And you know these fiber caps are, are very, very characteristic of them. Some caps have striations with sulcate edges. There, you've got a photograph of Russula pretervisor, which in Neath Talbot is relatively common in oak, oak woodland. So you can see the very distinct striations, but also right at the edge of the, um, uh, of the cap, it's, it's like a corrugated effect. And that's what you mean by a sulcate edge to the cap. And then you may have uh, remnants of veil or vulva, on the uh, on the cap itself. I mean, everybody knows this 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 microscopic fruity body, don't they? This is the fly agaric amate muscaria. So the typical white stippling on the top is uh, remains of, of, of veil and, and uh, sort of vulva. Or it can be very very scaly, such as you get with the shaggy scaly cap, folio to sclerosa. Again, you'd hardly um, sort of mistake this species if you saw it. Then we talk about some caps having an umbo, uh, which is like a pimple in the middle. So that little bump in the middle is called an umbo. Uh, and that's a feature of this species of Cortinarius, Cortinarius hemistrichus, uh, that very distinct pimple or umbo in the middle. And some caps are hygrophonous. In other words, as they dry out, they go paler in colour. And one, that one species which shows this brilliantly and shows it very, very quickly indeed is Clytosibi metacroa, which again we might come across tomorrow as a common component of Sitka forests. And it's called the two tone fundal for obvious reasons. So as the cap dries out, it goes, literally goes white. So that's what we call an agrophonous cap. All right, I said the degree to which the cuticle peels is a characteristic feature of some brittle gills in particular. This is Russula betularum, and if you take the edge of the cap, take the cuticle, that's the skin on top, you can peel it almost right off. And that's a very good ID feature for Russula betularum, plus the fact that it only grows with birch, and that it's usually a pale colour or a sort of pinky colour. Um, so that will identify Russula betularum for you, actually, in the field. So gills are important. What sort of things do you look at when you look at gills? Colour, colour change. Colour and character of the gill edge. You might want to, you should do a spore print. You might look at the thickness of the gills, the brittleness of the gills, the gill lengths, whether there are intermediate gills and longer gills, how the gills are attached to the stipe. Are they free? Are they adnate? Are they sinuate? Are they decurrent? You want to look for exudations. Is there a milky exudation from your gills? 
You may want to taste them and you may not. We are not saying in this course that you should taste fungi. All right, so uh, that's, we say that from the outset. And then there are chemical reactions that you can do. And we'll probably show you some of those tomorrow. So here's Russell Sardonia again tomorrow. And I've already, uh, sorry, here's Russell Sardonia again and we'll see it tomorrow. Um, and here's an example of uh, gills going from white to another color. They're going from white to primrose yellow. So that, that, that's a typical color change that we get with Russell Sardonia gills. Um, here you can see the distinctive red edge to the gills of the bleeding bonnet, Mycena sanguinolenta. Again, we might see this species tomorrow, it grows in carnivores. Gill attachment, it can be a little bit sort of, um, you know, so difficult to ascertain. So I'll show you the really sort of distinctive types of, of gill attachments. First of all, you shouldn't have any problem deciding that your gills are decurrent. That means that the gills actually run down the stem from the cap. So that's typical decurrent gills of ivory wax cap. We should see that tomorrow. And then yeah. there's a group of fungi called dapplings and many others as well, which are distinct in having free gills. The gills do not reach the stipe. So there's, as you can see with the arrow points there, there's a sort of a, a ring of white there. So the gills end before they actually get to the stem. Sinuate gills are often difficult to, to, to decide if, you, if you're a beginner, but the typical sinuate gills are seen in a group of fungi called the Knight's tricholoma and also in poison pies, that's the genus Hebeloma. Uh, we should see some Hebeloma tomorrow. I'm not sure about tricholoma. I'll, I'll bring a tricholoma along with me so you can see that anyway. Um, so this is tricholoma pessendata, um, which has got typical sinuate gills. So there's a waviness to the gill formation. As the gills leave the stipe, they dip downwards and then they wave along the cap underneath. So that's a sinuous gill structure. Look for exudates from the gill. There might be watery ex exudates, drops of water. And that, that is pretty useful if you're trying to identify a poison pie. Um, but it's most useful in things like the milk caps, which exude either a, a white cream or a yellow milk from the gills. And it's usually very, very obvious, like you can see here with Lactarius rufus. Um, here's an example of a chemical reaction. Again, I'm, I'm choosing Russellus sardonia because we, we'll see Russellus sardonia tomorrow. Um, in the little pot there, top left, you can see that some of the gills towards the bottom there are turning pink because they've been dipped in an ammonia solution. That's a pretty important character of Russellus sardonia because it could be confused with Russellus torulosa, which grows in the same environment and in fact might even grow with it but is a much, much rarer and really notable species. And really, I really wish we, we, we'll find it tomorrow. And we may very well find Russell Torlosa. So we'll have to do an ammonium reaction to sort that out, probably. Uh, another difference between them, by the way, is that Russell Sardonia has the primrose yellow gills, and Russell Sardonia tends to have white or creamy colored gills at maturity. But if they've if they, they're young specimens, then it's difficult because Russell sardonia has white gills when it's young. Spore colour is incredibly important. Um, and, and this is because in most guidebooks, the species are organised according to spore colour. So you have species like brittle gills, milk caps, knights and bonnets in the front of the book because they have white cream or ochre coloured gills. And then you'll have species like, uh, sorry, groups like pink gills and shields grouped together because they have pink spores. And then groups like web caps, fi fiber caps and poison pies, they have brown spores. And then those with very dark or black spores like the mushrooms, ink caps and brittle stems. Now, a clue to the color of the spores is actually the color of the mature gills because the gills tend to go the color of the spores as the spores mature and you get masses of them, particularly in, in, in general, like caught in areas, you know, the whole mass of the gills looks brown. And that's sometimes a very good game, but not always. Uh, you really need to do a spore print most of the time to be absolutely sure. Uh, once you've identified spore colour, using a guidebook becomes a lot easier because it saves you flicking through the book. You can go to a section of the book which deals with white spores or brown spores or black spores or whatever. So it does make it a lot easier. Here's an example of some spore prints. 
Um, some uh, brittle gills there, Russellas on the left side. We've got Russella versicolor, which is easily confused with Russella pularis, by the way, um, which has got some ochre color spores, whereas Russella ochreluca, which we will see tomorrow, has got white color spores. Cortinarius is a brown color spores. And then uh, the pink gills, they, the gills go pink because they have pink spores, as you can see there. But Clytopillus prunulus, which has got a wonderful English name, it's called the Miller, um, mainly because it's white and it, and it smells of flower. Um, in its young stage, it, it could look like a, a, a tricholoma or something, or, or a species which has white spores. And it's not then until you, you, you keep the uh, fruiting body and do a, uh, a spore print and you see that it's got pink spores. Um, so that's a characteristic feature of Clytophyllus prunulus, the Miller. So that's why, why it is sometimes important to do a spore print. Right, the stipe, um, color is important, shape, texture is important. Whether there's a ring or not, whether there are zones on the stipe is important. Presence of scales, is there a cortina? Is there a volvo? A volvo? No, a volva at the bottom of the stipe. Presence of mycelial cords at the bottom of the stipe could be a useful ID feature. Again, chemical reactions you can do. We'll cover that tomorrow in the course. And the stem may be totally absent. There may be no stipe. So here we got some amanitas. Uh, on the left hand side, the very beautiful amanita vaginatum, the grisette. And you, there you can see the typical sac like vulva at the bottom of the, uh, the, the stipe there. Note that the grisette does not have a ring on its stipe. And that's an important feature of this group of amanitas. It'll separate it from a whole load of other amanitas, like the one on the right, which is the false death cap, Amanita citrina, um, which does have a ring on it, but doesn't have much of a vulva. Vulva, vulva so I have a problem with that, aren't I? Uh, at the bottom of the stuff. It's more just a, a sort of bulby region there. So that's where, you know, knowing about these things is important in distinguishing different types of these toadstools. Here's a, an, another example of that, actually. These two trichelomas, the trichelomas are called knights. Uh, I can't remember what the English name of trichloma sculpturatum is, but the English name of trichloma singulatum is the girdled knight. And it's called the girdled knight because if you look at the stipe, it's got a ring on it, which is called the girdle. All right? But otherwise, it looks very much like trichloma sculpturatum. So you can tell these two apart simply by the fact that Trichloma singulatum, the girdle knight, has a, a ring on it. So that's an important feature. Okay, moving on. I mentioned Cortina or Cortina. That's a feature of uh, a, a very, very large group of fungi called the web caps, the biggest group of fungi in Europe. Uh, and there you can see a cobweb like veil over the young fruiting body there. That's called a Cortina. Um, Often when you collect a cotton areas, they mature fruiting bodies and there's no sign of a cortina at all. So beware of that. Always look for young fruiting bodies if you suspect your species is a, is a, a cotton areas. And some toadstools don't have any notable feature on, on these types at all. They're just plain. They don't have a, a ring. They don't have a vulva. There's no scales. There's no stipules. Nothing at all such as many species of Clytosibia, like the trooping fun of your Clytosibia geotropa. You may see bands of, of, of veil or uh, flocules or, what, or girdles or whatever you want to call them on the stipe. That's a feature of this fairly common Cortinarius, Cortinarius trivialis. As you can see there, the stipe has got these flocules or girdles on them. Or well, the stipe may be very, very scaly, like this one here. This is the green foot fiber cap, Inosibi calamistrata, uh, which is not uncommon in the fatal, but anyway, it always grows with Sitka. And then note that some agarics don't have a stem, they don't have a stipe at all. So we've got a mixture here on the left hand side that's Crepidotus variabilis, and then we've got Pleurotus osteatus there, top, top right, and uh, another Crepidotus whose name I can't remember at the moment. Uh, on bottom right there. So they're, they're agarics, but they don't have a stipe. Okay. 
So we come to the final section now, we just, we're nearing the end. Knowing something about habitats and communities of fungi is crucial because species are usually found in specific habitats. So this is not a random chaotic thing, okay? Although there are some species, several species, which can occur in multiple habitats, many species are only found in specific habitats. So first thing to do is make, make a note of where you are and what is growing there, what trees, for instance, are growing there. So species are usually found in specific habitats like woodlands, grasslands, fens, bogs, heathland, and surrounding. So make a note of that first and foremost. And then remember that many woodland fungi have specific mycory mycorrhizal associations with particular trees. So if you identify, let's say, a, a boletus of some sort, and in the description you, in your guidebook, it says only grows with, uh, I don't know, aspen. And there were no aspens anywhere in the environment. Then you can pretty much be certain you've made a mistake. You know? But if you found oak or birch there, then that will single it down, that will narrow it down to you know, much less in terms of options. So making note of what is growing there is really important, particularly in, with respect to trees. Um, and that's because, as it says there in, in the third panel, a number of garlics and bees are important mycorrhizal formers. Uh, and this is you know, very true of, of groups like the bullets, the brittle gills, the wrestlers and the milk caps, lactarius, and the web caps, cotinarius. Invariably, you know, individuals will be associated with a specific tree, specific, specific species of tree, or specific, specific type of tree. And lastly, uh, among many things I could talk about here, just don't have the time, and these are things for, for discussion tomorrow, really. Some fungal communities are really good indicators of biodiversity and biodiverse habitats and none more so than wax caps, pink gills, earth tongues, and things like that. They're absolutely brilliant indicators of biodiverse grassland. So please be aware of that. So here are fungi we're likely to find, for instance, in spruce or pine woodland habitats, such as the places we're going to go tomorrow. And I'm pretty confident we'll see many of these tomorrow. Russell sardonia, which has been a star feature of this talk, I think, uh, Mycena phylopes, which is a type of bonnet, Suilus bovinus there, Russula emetica, which is a, a bright red uh, brittle gill, Russula ochraluca, probably the most common agaric in East Batalda, uh, Amanita rubescens, which is called the blusher, and then Cortinarius obtusus, which I think we'll see tomorrow too. So these are typical species of pine woodland and spruce woodland. Um, and then, as I said, many uh, types of fungi are very, very good indicators of biodiverse mesotrophic grasslands. And in particular, wax caps yeah, in, in the panel, which is labelled A there, top left, pink gills uh, in the panel, labelled B, and then earth tongues there in the panel, labelled C. These are really things you should make note of if you find them in grasslands because you know they're really important biodiverse indicators. Okay, coming up to the end now. What about books then? God, you need deep pockets, I tell you that. Um, at the beginner level, I would say get a book like Colin's Complete Guide to British Mushrooms and Toadstools, mainly because it's got really good photographs in it. And another thing I like about it is that it's got this feature of showing you the top 100 um, mushrooms and toadstools in Britain. I think that's really nice. It also shows you quite a lot of ASCOs and other species which grow in specific places. I think it's a really good book. The book by Stefan Buxaki, Collins Fungi Guy, is also very useful, but it's mind-bogglingly sort of mesmeretic in its way it's illustrated. It's just pages and pages of fungi that all look exactly like the one on the page before. Um, but it is a good resource. But, you know, <laughs> things start disappearing from your wallet very, very quickly when you get into fungi. If there was one book I would recommend, or one volume of books, I should say, that I would recommend to everybody, it's Geoffrey Kibbe's Mushrooms and Toadstools of Britain and Europe. It's currently in four volumes. There's going to be a, a fifth volume as well. It's, to get the, all of them, it's going to cost you about £300. So, if, you know, this is an expensive hobby, guys. Another book I would 
recommend greatly is Roger Phillips's Mushrooms, which is he's a genius of a book, really. Uh, it, it was a real sort of revolution in terms of fungal identification. And then uh, as you get into fungi, you find that you, you may want to get sort of books on specific groups of fungi, like Mycena species. So you look for monographs of Mycena, or you might look for a monograph on Russula or Boletus. Uh, but again, it starts to get expensive. You know. um, if you want a book which has got comes in two volumes and it has got lots of really useful keys, it's unfortunately out of print at the moment. You need Funga Nordica, uh, which is a very very useful book. It covers all the mushrooms and toadstools in the northern uh, temperate regions of Europe. Okay, so books are important, and I'm sure we'll be bringing some tomorrow for you to look at. Some tips then before we go. Wherever you go, make a note and take photographs on the site. Make a note of what the habitat is, what your fungus is growing on, or what your fungus is growing with. It's important you collect it properly. Use a tool such as a small pen knife or something like that to dig it out. You're going to need the base of the site, which is under the ground, because there may be features there you need. And that feature could be a smell or it could be a structure. Uh, so, you know, any number of things. Note properties of the fresh specimens. Things might change when you get home. So the smell, the presence of a cortina, colour changes, sliminess and so on, all important. And note the way in which the specimens are growing. Was it growing as an isolated individual or was it growing in a group? Was it growing fused together with lots of others? Or was it growing in a troop with lots of them scattered? Or was it, you know, as I said, growing on its own? Take photographs, make notes about the habitat and what it was growing with. When you get home, look at things as soon as you can. Store in a, cont in a cont container um, uh, in the field, such as a box with compartments or a Tupperware container. I tend to use Tupperware containers. Uh, have a selection of small, medium and large containers if possible so for the different size specimens you're going to collect. And don't over collect. Like you only need a few fruiting bodies, but you may need a selection of immature and mature uh, examples to, to do an accurate determination. And don't, at first at least, don't collect too many species. You'll end up not identifying most of them. They'll all rot and you'll have to throw them away. And don't put too many specimens in one container. Okay, at home, examine as soon as possible. Take a spore print if you can. Have a sort of card or paper available. Black and white colours are very useful. Um, if you can't examine them straight away, store them in a cool place. You, you can do this in a refrigerator in a, as long as you have a sealed sort of uh, box to put them into. Make sure they're away from children, obviously, so health and safety is very important there. Most fungi will decay into a fetid mess if left at room, room temperature for too long, so, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a given, that's going to happen if you're not careful. And examine all parts, noting features of cap, stem and gills. You may need to use a hand lens uh, and you'll need a good identification guide such as I've outlined to you. And it can take a long time to identify a fungus. And when I say it might take days, I'm not joking. So sometimes your specimens will remain unidentified and you'll end up in tears throwing them away. If you can, ask an expert. Sometimes a fungus can be identified from a photograph by someone who is very familiar with fungi. So get to know the common genera, right? Things like Cortinarius, uh, a common genera, get to know what they look like. That's a, that's a very good tip. Get to know things like milk cups, which are fairly easy to, to, to know because they exude the milk. Get to know the ink cups, which are fairly familiar to most people. Okay, many of them deliquesce down to an inky mess, such as the uh, lawyer's wig, which you call shaggy ink up, which you, you, you can see there, top, top left. Um, and get to know common species. I mean, sulfur tuft there, bottom left, must be one of the most common species in Britain. You'll get to know that fairly quickly. Bearded milk cap, which is a very, very hairy milk cap, uh, is a fairly straightforward one. Orcher brittle gill is so common. And then the deceiver, which although it's very variable in its structure and colour, uh, does have sort of a jizz about it, if you like, as birders say, 
and get to know that persistently and creatively common species. Finally, this is where we're going tomorrow. Uh, we were going to go to a spruce forest as well. And fortunately, the spruce forest has been cut down. There is some of it still left. So we will look a little bit at the spruce forest. Um, but we're spending most of our time in this place here, which is a lodgepole pine forest on a coal tip. Uh, as Richie said in the beginning, please don't ask questions now because you can ask all questions tomorrow and we can have a good discussion. Uh, we're going to bring a table along with us and Emma and I will bring specimens with us and to lay out for you to see, uh, as well as specimens that you yourselves will gather when you do the foray tomorrow. So other than that, uh, if you want to put comments in the comment box, that's fine. But we, we're not answering questions at this stage. I guess that's it.